Welcome to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm Lisa Watson and will be joined by my co-hosts Nicole Frolic and Brian Koenigberg. The Enlighten Up podcast is a weekly show that provides an unconventional and refreshing spin on spirituality, where three friends and weekly guests share informative, fun, and usually off-the-wall conversations. Unlike others, we provide fringe and skeptical viewpoints on all topics, because our experience has taught us that the echo chamber is a boring place from which to learn. So regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, we can promise you, you're going to find a place to fit in here. So we invite you to grab a drink and listen in on our casual, entertaining, and hopefully enlightening conversation. And Enlighten Up is a self-funded podcast. So if you would like to help us to continue to be able to produce, enhance, and expand the show for our audience, then please send your support using the link in the show notes or go to our website, lightenup.us, and check out our merchandise shop where you can purchase merchandise that will allow you to express some spiritual humor. You may also show your support by leaving us a review on iTunes and following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you all so much for listening and supporting us. And now let's jump right into the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. I am Nicole Frolic, one of your co-hosts, and I am joined by Lisa Watson. We are sadly not here with uh, our infamous Brian. He's not here today, but we are excited to tell you that we have a returning guest. We have Danny Levin back from... um, but a year ago, he was on the show, and uh, he walked away from a huge opportunity uh, to work his way up from pushing a broom to running a million-dollar business, to hitchhiking around the world, to find p- uh, happiness and inner peace. His life has been dedicated to finding the peace and contentment that comes from truly knowing yourself, and his mission has become holding the space for others to find that peace, too. He is also the author of The Mosaic, a beautiful fable that touches the heart and soothes the soul. But to this day, he feels he is not the author. He knows it was the characters of the fable that actually wrote the story. Danny, welcome back. How you hey. doing? Hey, it's so good to hear you. And it's mm-hmm. such a pleasure to be back. And I'm, and I'm so devastated by the fact that our brother Brian is no longer as skeptical about what I'm doing as he was before. I know. You know, last time you were on, you really, you, you got him. You got him at the beginning. You know, you, you were pushing his buttons and you really wanted to get him into that skeptic mode. <laughs> but I, I love that. You, yeah. And you had said, though, when you listened to one of the episodes that he didn't sound like a skeptic. He sounded like, I think, what did you say? A new age bumpkin? <laughs> maybe, oh, jeez. Maybe, maybe. He probably loved that. Yeah. So what's been going on in... uh in Danny's life, I. But before we started the show, you were mentioning that you are scared shitless over something. Please enlighten us. Well, <laughs> so there's this exciting moment where I think you know the 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 sort of catch-all phrase of nothing. The magic happens outside of your comfort zone, and as long as you're comfortable, there's nothing really that's going to happen. And I think for me, what's happening is there's so much excitement that I'm about to embrace. I'm about to go out and do what I said I was going to do. I'm leaving May 1st to take a trip around America, a one year journey to sit with the people that nobody listens to, to listen to those people who feel unheard. And I don't know how I'm doing that. I don't know how it's going to materialize. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know what, what, what mode of travel I'm going to take. But I can tell you, I put an I put a entry a post on Facebook, and I said I'm doing this, and I'm going to be traveling for one year. And is anybody would anybody be willing to help me in any way by uh, cook, cooking a warm meal or giving me a hot shower or do, uh, letting me come and do my laundry or letting me stay with you or finding a gathering or in a place? And so I got 45 people who responded, and those aren't even people that I know. So so. I haven't even sent it out to my friends because I still can't fathom that I'm a six. I'm leaving the day after I turn 65. My body is not the body of of a young active guy. I have pain all through my body. I have all sorts of things going on, but I feel so compelled by this this fire that's burning inside of me to reconnect the disconnected world by just listening to people. Like when I look at the political situation that's going on in the world today, 
it used to be Democrats would not listen to Republicans, but Democrats aren't even listening to each other. I, you watch the political debate, you know, a few days ago, and and it's like a it's like a it's ugly. People are just screaming over each other and putting each other down, and they're not talking about issues anymore. They're just talking about how do I get to be my place? How do I put you down so I can excel? That isn't the world that I want to live in. And when I thought about it, I have a podcast also, and at the end of my podcast, I always ask people, when you look out your window, is this the world that you always wanted to give over to your, to your children? And most of the people say, no, it's not. And so it made me start to wonder, well, if this isn't the world we want to give to our kids, what are we going to do about it? How, how will we change that? Because if, if we don't do anything, nothing's going to change. So as we get further into our conversation together, I'll tell you one of the steps that I'm thinking of doing of how to create a massive change. Because like Bucky Fuller says, you can't solve the problems of today with the thinking of today. You've got to create a new model that makes this, op- this model obsolete. And I've got the people and I've got the systems and I've got the technology involved to do that. It just scares the heck out of me. Yeah. And that's, that's very interesting because that actually brings me to something I wanted to bring up with you today. And and I think it, it ties in beautifully with what you're just talking about. It's one of your blogs that you wrote on um, about the super conscious mind. And um, if you don't mind, I just want to read a quick portion of it to the audience. Um, that in a soul session today, I felt that the soul of the person I was speaking to wanted to increase the flow they were allowing to move through them by both turning up the water pressure and increasing the size of the hose. Their soul said to me, there is so much more I want to give than what you are letting come through. And as we spoke more, this person explained to me all of the work that they have done on themselves, affirmations, law of attraction, hypnosis, body work. And then I heard their soul ask me to tell them, The answer to your tension is not found in the conscious or unconscious mind. You must experience the super conscious mind. Can you elaborate on that? Because that's beautiful. Thank you. What did you find beautiful in it, by the way? Well, because we operate so much. You were just talking about this idea of, you know, you can't solve today's problems from the same mindset that we're we're in. And this idea of going into the super conscious mind, I feel, is perhaps a key keystone to that and that if we want to um, make other changes, do we actually access those changes from this current present mindset or do we access it from the super conscious? So let me try and say it in as clear a way as possible because I've listened to some of your podcasts and there, and you have some pretty weird people on and I I don't want (laughs) to. Why, thank you. (laughs) I know. I know you love that. I want to try and be as normal as possible. Okay. And that's why I miss Brian because I I, I was counting on him to keep me normal. Um, Here's the thing. We have to become aligned with what we actually believe. And what we believe is our choice. It's we're the authors of our own story. We can write the book of our life however we want to write it. We can tear out the pages that no longer fit. We can rewrite it. We can edit it. We can change it around. But the life story that we have is the life story we have to write. And when we're out of alignment with what we actually believe, then life doesn't work very well. What the conscious and unconscious mind does is the unconscious mind takes, for instance, the most important thing that we have we give over to the unconscious mind to do for us because it's too complicated for us to do it on our own. And that's our breath. But you can go months without food. You can go weeks without water. But you can only go a few seconds without breath. And so the very thing that gives us life, we relegate to the unconscious mind. Well, what would happen if we did do that? What would happen if we started to become more conscious of the breath as the vehicle of our life? And what would happen if we realized that in the pattern of our breath, it's actually giving us the the roadmap, the blueprint for how we're living our life? Think about it. Before you think about it, before you concentrate on your breath, watch your breath. 
what pattern are you in? What, how are you guys breathing right now without being, I'm not asking you to change your breath. I'm not asking you to control it. I'm asking you when you look at your breath, what, what is your breath pattern right now? Steady. Relaxed. Okay. Is it short or long? Well, it's definitely shorter than when I'm consciously doing okay. it. Is it, is your inhalation and your exhalation the same length or di different? same my um inhale is a little longer okay so when we look at the patterns of breath and you can you know i didn't mean to put you on the spot but i sort of did but uh, but when you look at the patterns of your breath what i find about myself and let's let me make it easy when i'm not concentrating on my breath i have pretty much a shallow inhalation and a shallow exhalation I'm, I'm, I'm not really, what, what's that really saying? I'm really not letting too much of the world into me and I'm really not giving too much of the world of myself to the world. Like I'm just staying very on the outside of life. When I notice my breath changes, when I notice that I have a, a deeper inhalation and a shallow exhalation, and we know a lot of people like that, where they'll take everything from life. They'll take everything from you. They'll take everything, but they don't know how to give. And so we see that in, in the pattern of our breath, those people who are great at taking, but not very good at giving. And the same thing happens the other way. When we have a deep exhalation and a shallow inhalation, we know so many people who give and give and give, but they have no idea how to receive. I'm one of those people. I've been one of those people for a long time. I love to give, but I'm scared to death to receive. And part of the reason that I'm scared to death to do this trip that I'm about to do is because I'm totally at the mercy of other people. And that scares me because I don't have the control that I want to have. But all three of those breathing patterns have, have as beautiful as they are, have tremendous flaws in them. The one breathing pattern that has, that has complete and, and total benefit for us. And you can feel it. Take everybody who's listening, if you feel to right now, just take three deep inhalations and three deep exhalations. And notice how you feel before you do it. And take those three inhalations and three exhalations. Do it at your own pace because everybody's pace is different. And then take five more of those. And I wonder if after taking 10 deep inhalations and 10 deep exhalations, you don't feel different. Because what's a deep inhalation and deep exhalation say? A deep inhalation is someone who trusts the world enough that they let the world come into them and enter into every fiber of their, of their being. A deep exhalation says, I want to give every part of myself to the world again. So we bring the world in and we bless it inside of ourselves and we, and we breathe it out with the blessing of our life into it. When we're unconscious, when we live in the unconscious world, shallow inhalation, shallow exhalation. When we live in the conscious world, we can alter our breath. Okay, we can say, I want, to, I want to breathe slower and I'm going to breathe deeper. So now I become conscious and now I can change that. When we live in the super conscious world, what happens is we realize that it's not us that's breathing. It's the breath breathing the breath through the breath. And I know that sounds a little confusing. But we are no different than the, we are no different than the breath that we are breathing and the process of the breath that we're experiencing. In, in the process of letting go of everything that we know about ourselves, of everything we believe, I'm having this very personal experience of this right now. I believe with all my heart, and I tell people all the time, just trust in the universe, trust in God. So you'll be taken care of. Everything will work out. You know that. You know that to be true. But when I looked at my life, I didn't see my life playing out in that pattern. 
I saw myself doing everything I possibly could to take care of myself and make sure that I had a good, a, a lot of money coming in, enough, enough food in the house, enough, you know, taking care of my wife and my kids. But when I said to myself, what would happen if I actually trusted in God to allow God to really take care of me? What would happen? How would that look? And I'm just doing this experiment now and finding that how beautiful the experiment is because out of nowhere, things are happening. I got a call from a friend of mine just the other day, and she said, I really want to get you into a bunch of churches. I just spoke to a guy that I never even knew existed who can help me go into churches and speak to, speak to congregations. But I need to clarify. I need to be, be sure what my message is is clear. And he's going to help me to do that. But he, I didn't even know he existed three minutes ago. So what would be possible if we allowed the world to give to us what it wants to give to us? What would allow, what would be possible if we went into a super consciousness where we were not in charge anymore, but we connected to that which aligns us to what we actually believe? How would our world change? How would even the tone of our voice change? Remember, I don't know if I said this on the podcast a year ago, because I, I um, don't have that good a memory. But when I speak to people and when I'm speaking here on the podcast, most of what I'm doing is just trying to occupy your mind with the words that I'm saying. Because really what I'm trying to do is put a vibration out into the, into the conversation that touches your heart and touches your soul. And when the mind isn't occupied, the mind goes, what's, what are you doing? What are you, what are, what's going on there? But when the mind is occupied with pleasant conversation, it lets up and it lets the soul actually talk to soul and heart talk to heart. And that's where transformation happens. When we get to that place, that's when, that's when we transform. Does that make sense? Yes. You're just as weird as all the rest. Oh, of them. darn. I wish I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I like being weird like everybody else, I guess. Huh? <laughs> no, that was great. And so when we are, um, you know, you just that, that, that what you just said at the end there, uh, this idea of occupying our minds with words and because you're putting out a vibration and you can feel your vibration it's very palpable to me uh you 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 have a very soothing calm way and you have you know excuse me you know where to put inflections in your voice i think naturally i don't think you're doing it um consciously uh, purposefully yeah um that take you through a story you know the rise and the fall of a story that keeps someone engaged and that idea of, you know, when someone is looking for answers or someone is needing help to have someone to talk to, uh, that idea that you just were talking about of occupying someone's mind with words so that they can tune into that vibration. Yep. I never thought about it that way before. Yeah, no, most people don't. Most people, and what happened for me, it was in the process of writing the mosaic and then hearing the story come and feeling what happened in it. Um, the story of the mosaic is beautiful. The words, the story that the words tell is exquisite. I think it's, I think it's really a beautiful story, mainly because the characters wrote it through me, not me. But what I realized over time is sitting with it, reading it over and over and over again and being with it and talking to people about it and creating a work around it, that the space in between the story, the space in between the words also is speaking. And what does that space say? What's the vibration of the book carry? And the words, the words will inspire people. That's what words do. We get inspired by the words we hear, but they don't transform us. Transformation comes when we let go. When we let go of the things we think and feel and believe, and we just and we just allow ourselves to experience this experience of another person and us coming together. 
it goes beyond body and mind. It goes to energy. And if as long as we stay in the body and the mind, as long as we let, allow the mind to occupy our time, then we're still in the body. We're not allowing ourselves to experience this new wave of energy that's coming in. We're moving from a world where we are form and matter to a world where we are energy and we're seeing it happen all, all across. We're in the early stages of all that opening up and developing. What you're exhaling right now, I'm inhaling one second later and I don't even know where you are, but it doesn't matter because energy moves that quickly. There's no time and mm -hmm. space that, that keeps us from one another. And the more we can experience the super consciousness of how connected we are, that we're all part of the same mosaic, we're all pieces and our pieces are great, but the mosaic is much greater because it's the, it's the totality of all of our pieces. Well, this idea of, of um, moving into the super conscious world, the super conscious mind, um, more of like allowing ourselves to go there and you just opening up the show talking about your fear of you know what have I just allowed God to oh, support me in my world how do you yeah how do you well how do you coach your clients to surrender um I'm honest with them you know I I don't one of the things about me is I never try to be more than I am um, because who I am is enough. Like I, I share very openly. That's the first thing I said to you when we got on the phone, you asked me how you're doing. I said, I'm scared. Of I'm scared shitless. Right. But I'm also so excited because then the other side of the coin of fear is when we move out of our comfort zone, that's when we experience the magic of our life. And so many of us stay in those comfort zones. So many of us never allow ourselves to get scared because we're scared of being scared. I'm not scared of being scared. I just know to notice that it's there. And so the beauty of being able to like, here's really what I do in coaching. And here's really the work that I do is I just invite people to let go. Just let go of everything you think, everything you believe, everything you feel, everything you think, you know, just let go of it. Just let it just go. Because as long as you stay full of what you have, nothing else can enter you. You know the story, I might have told it to you before, of the guy who comes to the Zen master to learn Zen, and the master says to him, let's have a cup of tea. And he pours a cup of tea, and the student's looking at him as he keeps pouring, because the tea cup's full, and it keeps overflowing and going into the floor and going over. And, and, he, and the student says, sir, can you see the cup is full? And the Zen master says to the student, oh, thank you. Can you see that you're full? So you've come here already full to the brim and everything that you want me to put into you is only going to go into the floor. So empty yourself a little bit and come back. Then I can put something into you. Well, we're so full of all the things we think and all the things we know and all the things we believe and all the things we're too scared to challenge ourselves to see. And we're so full of the fact that we don't want to be scared, that we don't allow ourselves to be scared by the life in front of us. Being scared by what's in front of us means we're alive. It's so important and so vital and so powerful to experience that fear. Because on the other side of that fear is all of our passion and all of our energy and all of the, our enthusiasm. It's what gives us life to experience that. And so I say, let go of it all. And I say to myself, as I feel, as, as, as my fear blocks me, there's, there's, a, there's fears, there's different sides of fear. One fear propels you forward because you're so excited and so scared that you just have to move from the place that you're in because you got to get out of it. The other one is a fear that blocks you and doesn't let you move out of where you are. It keeps you where you are and you stay in that comfort zone and you just want to stay there and, as, and you're so comfortable and it's so good, but you're so uncomfortable because you're not happy living the life you're living. But you, prove, but you convince yourself that I'm comfortable here. If you're in that second fear, yeah. you want to get out. That ego, it's very tricky. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's that place where we're so scared to experience experiences. 
that we cut ourselves off from all experiences. We put walls around ourselves. We stay in our silos. We don't allow anybody in and we don't allow anybody out. It's that shallow breath that most of us breathe all the time when we're not concentrating on it. It's a very shallow existence. Nobody in, nobody out. Nothing in, nothing out. I've been doing this challenge, 365 day challenge, to do something new or different every day. Wow. In an effort to break myself of that. How's <laughs> that it's going? Just, it's going well. Sometimes it's just little things. You know, most of the time it's just little things. Like I ate a whole avocado the other day. Skin, <laughs> nut, everything. Oh, no, skin? Everything. The whole the nut? The nut, everything. Oh, my God. Right. But just to move myself outside my comfort zone. You know, sometimes oh. I don't use one of my hands for the day or I do something blindfolded or, you know, just using, just doing simple things that you can do just to get yourself out of that rut where you're just creating your future through your past because every day is the same. Your thoughts are the same. Your people you interact with are the same. You know, you do everything the same. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize I'm doing something similar, but it's not like eating the skin of an avocado in the nut. Um, but it's for me right now, what I'm really, what I'm really involved in is this whole idea of listening. I'm about to go on a listening tour and I'm not going on a listening tour because I'm a great listener. I'm going on a listening tour because I need to learn how to listen. And there was a friend of mine who said to me, she had me on her podcast and one of the things she said to me is, as you go out on this tour, because she went on that, this a tour similar to what I was doing seven years ago. And she said, I wish I could, I wish I could save you from going out there because you'll experience some of the darkest and, and hardest moments you'll ever experience. But I can't because this is yours to do it, to go. But you just have to see that everything in life that happens is a reflection of you speaking to you about you and I just went whoa you know like like I'd heard I know that life's a mirror and, and that the, the world outside of me is a mirror but I don't think I realized somehow when she said it it just pierced into me because I was talking to her about when I go I want to go and meet with communities like the Ku Klux Klan and I want to sit with them and hear and hear why do they feel so unheard why do they have to do the things they do? Because if someone would just listen to them, what would they want to say? You know, that, that I think is indicative of a where our world is currently at this time. I remember reading about um, a black man who walked into, um, I believe it was a Ku Klux Klan meeting and um, sat there and everyone just looked at him like he was, you know, crazy for being there. And he, he had the exact same reason that you did. He's like, if we don't listen to one another, how are we ever going to understand yeah. one another? And it, and it's so true. And we, we live in such a polarized um, world right now of, you know, left and right, um, black and white. And it's, it speaks volumes as to where we're all at as a collective in our listening skills. Everyone wants to be heard and um, no one's willing to listen. not a lot gets done. <laughs> yeah. No one's willing to so, listen. So just listen to that statement. All of us, it's, it's being heard and being listened to is almost as primal as having air and water and food. We all crave to be, the, the, uh, be to be understood, to be heard. When I, when I would travel around the world before, I had the opportunity to be amongst, to sit and have dinner and, be, and call as my friends, some of the richest people in the world. I would sit with them over a dinner table. I would meet their children. I would know their parents. I, would, I, would, I, I didn't just sit and listen to them give talks in, in lecture halls. I sat and, and I knew them. They were my friends. And I also had the opportunity to sit with, on cardboard boxes with some of the poorest people that you could ever imagine. They were the poorest of the poor. And you know something? Not one of them asked me to agree with what they said. All any of them wanted was just for me to love and accept them, just as they are. 
The rich man wanted me to love him, not because he had money, just because he, I loved him as a person. The poor man wanted me to just love him because he, he wanted to show me his heart. He wanted to show me who he was behind that. And I asked this poor person, I remember sitting next to him, and I said to him, is this the world you always dreamed you would live in? And he said, oh, God, no. And I said, what would you change? And he said, if people would only take 10 minutes to just listen, to, an, to ask somebody how they're doing and just listen to their response, it would change people's lives. And I said, tell me about that. I mean, I, I agree with you. What a beautiful thing to do. But why that one thing out of all the things you could have told me? You could have told me, yeah, you give people food. You could have told me find shelter for people because here you are homeless. You don't have food. You don't have home. You, why, why is it listening so important? And he said, Danny, I'm going to tell you a story. A few days ago, I'm an empath, and I realized that everybody who passes me by has scorned for me. They, they hate me. They treat me worse than they would treat an, an animal. And some people come and hit me and kick me and beat me up. Some people walk by and spit on me. And I thought, what am I doing in this world? Nobody, nobody cares about me, and I don't, I don't, I'm, not in, I'm not doing anything in this world. And why would I just sit here and get beaten up and scorned at and, and, and just thought about so badly? I'm just going to end my life tonight. When the streets are quiet, I'm just going to end my life. And not two minutes after that, I had that thought, a man came up to me that I never saw before, and he put his arm on my, he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, how are you today? And I said, it's not going so well. He said, can I sit with you and just listen to you? T tell me about it. And, he sa and I said, yeah. He sat on, it only took 10 minutes for me to share with him what I was going through. But he spent those 10 minutes listening to me. And I realized I can't kill myself today because somebody cares about me. He said, you have no idea how much impact what you do has on another person. And it's interesting to me now, as I get ready to start this listening tour around America, Corey has no idea how much his words impacted me. Because all I want to do is speak to those people who feel unlistened to and listen to them. And it's Corey's message that I'm taking to heart. And he has no idea the impact that he had, that I'll create a documentary of the voice of the voiceless. I will film what people say that, are, that don't feel heard so that what can happen is the world hears those voices. How powerful will that be? So if I can invite you and your, and your listeners today to spend 10 minutes, 10 minutes in the course of a lifetime is not a lot to ask, to just be with somebody and ask them how they're doing. And take the time to listen. Who knows what world we would live in then. I think a lot of that stems from all of our childhoods of not truly being heard or not feeling like we were ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we resort as adults to living out um, our desires to be heard and seen in very... Mm, sometimes childish ways because it's pulling in off those, um, off those feelings and those memories that have been buried. Mm -hmm. Well, I can, I, I have a different experience of it because I think you might remember I have a developmentally delayed daughter. Yes. Yes. And so, and she doesn't have the ability to speak like we speak. So when she speaks and she doesn't get heard, she screams. And most of the time I can understand her, but sometimes I don't. And she'll just, and so she gets so frustrated, she starts to scream it. But it's not the volume that I don't understand. It's the clarity of her voice. And when she screams and I don't understand it, she'll go into a tantrum. And, and it doesn't matter where we are. We can be in a restaurant. We can be driving in a, in a car. 
We can be in a, in, a, in a movie theater. We can be wherever we are. It doesn't matter what happened. It, it just, all of a sudden, she'll go, she'll start screaming. And when she screams and she doesn't get heard, and she tantrums and she doesn't get heard, then she'll start, she'll come and attack me. She'll try and rip my shirt or bite me. And this went on for a long time. She's 30 years old now. And it happened to start it up about, I'm going to say, 20 years ago. And so every day for 15 years, we would have anywhere from 1 to 15 incidences of that happening a day. And that was really hard for me. And as much as I loved her and cared for her, those were hard moments because I didn't know when it was going to erupt or what was going to happen or what she was trying to say. And I couldn't understand her. And it frustrated me so much. And it frustrated her even more. And finally, after a long time, you would think I would have done it sooner. I said to her, Elisa, my sweetheart, in the midst of your rage, I can't understand you. Can you tell, talk to me in a different way than you're talking to me now? And she looked at me from the midst of her rage and had a big smile on her face. And she said, I am, Daddy. And I said, what the heck do you mean you are, Daddy? What's that mean? What are you doing? And she took her finger and put it to the side of her head by where her brain is. And I said, you little son of a gun, have you been putting thoughts into my head? And she started laughing hysterically as if finally I had found the key to what she was trying to do. She was communicating to me, but I just didn't, I didn't trust it. I didn't understand it. She was telling me what she wanted because she couldn't use her mouth. She was putting thoughts into my head that I understood and I knew she was doing. I just didn't trust. And do you know that day was about five years ago? And in the five years that have passed between that day and today, she never yells, she never tantrums, and she never attacks anyone. Not with me, because she knows that when she gets to that place, she can put a thought in my head and I'll hear it. That's amazing. We are all desperately wanting to be heard. And what happens is we start to scream and yell and tantrum and, and, and do it. And I realized every person I meet is exactly Elisa. They can run a government. They can run a business. They can run a family. They can run a community. They can run a church. They can run a synagogue. They can run anything. But we all go through that same pattern. If we speak and we don't get heard, we yell. We yell and we don't get heard, we create chaos or disruption. We create disruption and we don't get heard, we try and destroy. We can destroy a building. We can destroy, we can take a gun and shoot people in a town square. We can destroy a reputation of somebody. We can try and destroy a business. We can try and go after a friend. What's important is that we understand the pattern and we find a way to listen. Because everybody wants to be heard, but nobody's really listening. And I don't mean to make it black and white. There are people that listen. Of course we listen. But not to the extent that the world wants to be heard. That's why I'm going on the road. That's why I'm scared to death. Because I'm not doing this because I know how to listen. I'm doing it because I want to learn how to listen. I want the voices of people to teach me how to listen. I'm not doing it to fix the world or change the world. I'm doing it to learn from the world how to, how to, how to become the person I know I have to be. Well, that, this is just takes us full circle yeah. <laughs> back to what you scared were talking shitless. about, about this idea. <laughs> well, being scared shitless, but also this idea of, you know, you, you're just using words, but really it's about the vibration yes. and the same applies for the listening. Yes. You know, it's more about you're, you're listening to their words, but or you're, I should say you're hearing their words, but you're listening to their heart. Yes. And so what's really interesting, and this, this is in the work that I do also, because I talk a lot. So I, I, I sat with myself and I said, how can someone who, talk, who talks so much want to give a message of listening? And when I actually listened to what my soul was saying to me, it said, Danny, it's not in the wor it's not in the words that you, you're not you, the what you're listening to is not the words another person's saying. What you're listening to is the vibration that's inter inter interchanging. And so you can talk all day long if you stay open to listen to what their soul is saying to them, and you reflect that back, and you sort of talk about things that their soul is saying that leaves them comfortable enough to know you're not talking right at them, but you're talking about something else. They'll get it. And so it's, it's this beautiful dance 
of a superconscious mind that doesn't work like the way everything else works. One of the things the mosaic, the book taught me was nothing is the way we see it. We think this is the world we see. In the same moment, there's millions of other worlds that other people see. And when we can start to see the world through the way other people see, when we can start to listen to what other people are saying, not to not even what they're saying with their words, because sometimes their words are just trying to get our attention, but listen to the what they're really saying. What would you say in your business if you could really speak? What would you say to your kids if you could really tell them what you want to say? What would you say to your spouse if you knew they were really listening to you? What would you say to your religious leaders? What would you say to your politicians? What would you say to the world if you knew the world was listening? That's what I want to capture on film. So you're filming all this? Yeah, I'm going to film it. Uh, right now, I'm filming it with just my my iPhone. But along the way, I believe I've, I've had four film crews come to me and sit in my house, some for as many as 10, 12 hours um, during the day, and just talk with me about what I want to do and talk with me about how to do it. And it's just too premature right now. Nobody quite gets it. So I want to film it with my with, with my iPhone. And I want the intimacy of just sitting with somebody without a, without a bunch of cameras and lighting and all that, just to sit with them and say, may I mm. film you? And, if, and some people are fine with being filmed and, and say what they want to say, and some people don't want to be on film. So what I'll do when people don't want to be on film is I'll just, after our conversations, I'll take notes of what they say, and after our conversation, I'll just narrate what the conversation was so that other people could hear what the voice of the voice is like. When we talk about this idea of of listening and also allowing someone to speak, there's so many people who don't feel heard. I mean, the vast population on this earth do not feel heard, just as you were talking about earlier. Oftentimes, people are speaking in a way of trying to convince someone of something or to change their mind about something. How do you help people understand the pitfalls of that and how to get to the heart of the matter and what they actually really want to say? Good question. If you think about my daughter's story, speak, yell, tantrum, attack. When we try and convince somebody to think like we think, isn't that just right in that in that uh, line of doing something? We we're not we may not be yelling, but we're we're. Why would we ever need to get somebody to believe like we believe? Why do we need to convince somebody to say to have the same thoughts that we have? Why do we need to have anybody follow us or 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 do what we do? It just doesn't make any sense. The answer to everything is when we find ourselves doing that, listen again to the world around us. Like, if we were so sure about the world we're living and the life that we're living, and we were so sure that it was the right way, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have. But most of the people I know are still working on something or other. Why not listen to see if the answer to what we're working on would be found outside of the realm of our comfort zone, outside of the silo of what we always think. Why, instead of trying to convince somebody else to believe like we believe, why not spend time to listen to what they believe and see how it integrates and see what would happen if we allowed the possibility of their belief to come into our system. This whole practice is a practice that goes from talking to listening. And what the power of listening gives us is the ability to receive from other people. Remember the breathing patterns that we started out with. So many of us are great givers. So many of us want to change the world. I have no desire to change the world. The world's doing just fine. 
I have to decide to change myself. I'm doing just fine too, but I, but I, I, I believe the world that I would experience if I let go of the world that I'm holding on to would be even richer and more beautiful. So how do we just let go of all this desire to change another person? How do we just let go of all this thought that I'm right and you're wrong and I have to convince you of what I'm doing? Why? I would just suggest to people that they, when they see themselves doing that, to start to listen more deeply. It's, it definitely comes from a place I've discovered mostly through my own awareness of myself <laughs> that I used to want to convince people to um, understand me or see me or, you know, if I was proud of certain accomplish accomplishments I'd made that fell outside the realm of what other people thought were accomplishments, I would push hard for them to see it. And I realized that in, you know, in my case, it was because I truly wasn't acknowledging myself and I was still looking for it outside of myself. And as I started to, as you say, get more comfortable with the parts I'm not comfortable with about myself, that need to convince others started to fall away. And there's a sense of peace that comes in where even if someone doesn't believe you, it doesn't matter anymore because it's not part of the equation. Well, I think everything matters. I don't say that it doesn't matter, but it's like, it's, it, it's so beautiful that people disagree. Somewhere along the line, we think because we disagree, we have to fight. Sometimes, somewhere along the line, we think because we, we, we don't think the same, we, don't, we can't get along. But the mountain doesn't try to be a, the river, nor does the river try to be the mountain. They realize they're completely different. But in the coexistence of the mountain with the river, there's a beautiful scenario that's created. Mm -hmm. And so in a mosaic, the, the yellow piece doesn't tell the orange piece to become yellow. It's the diversity of all of our pieces together that make the artistry of what we're doing a beautiful world. There's a richness in our diversity, but somehow we believe if, we're, if, if someone disagrees with us, they're wrong or we're wrong. How about if everybody's right? How about if the world exists in a super conscious way where every way that the world is seen is seen correctly? And we can, we can, we can get enriched by seeing the world differently the way other people see it. Fight me. There's like, so what do you think is the, um, what do you think is the real fear behind people fearing someone else not agreeing with them? <laughs> um, I think I, I can only tell you what my fear is when I don't feel good enough. And then you tell me that what I, what, what I am is not good enough or what I believe or what I think is wrong or you, you tell me that, that you're, you have a better way of seeing it, it just, it just waters the weed in my garden of not feeling good enough. It has nothing to do mm -hmm. with you. Remember that saying that the woman told me as I go out on my journey, everything that happens in life is a reflection of me speaking to me about me. And this is the whole point, though, and this is why when your perception of self shifts, your perception of what people are saying to you or what you're hearing uh, shifts as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have we have the opportunity to see the world any way we want to see the world. That's the beauty of the life we're living. And it's such a beautiful world to see it. Why not see it with all its diversity? Why not? Why not? Why not discover and be excited by all the fears that we have? Why not look and say, gosh, I'm really scared. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm going to sleep. I don't know even how I'm going to get from place to place. Will I take a train? Will I take a van? Will I take a car? How, will, I, will I hitchhike? Will I, will I walk? Will I take a bus? How will I even do it? But it's so exciting. Like what? I have, there's no certainty in that. And it's so, it's so fabulously exciting. But if I flip the coin over, it's so scary. Like, what do you mean you don't know how you're going to get there? 
Like you don't even know how you're going to get from San Diego to Los Angeles when you leave in two months and you don't have that all worked out. Are you kidding me? You don't know how you're, who you're going to talk to and how it's going to help. No, I'm just going to trust that somehow it's all going to happen. It's, it's a beautiful way to live. I did that when I was 31 for a few months. Um, not, not a full year, not to the extent that I did it for a few months. And I, like you, like many people, had a very desperate need to control everything in my yeah. life. And this idea of surrendering to, to allowing God to support you, the universe, however you want to call it, um, but something greater than you to take care of you and to trust in that and to know that there could be plans greater than the ones your mind can conceive for you in this moment uh, is a very interesting way to live. And it's, it, you're right, it's scary, but it sparks that passion for life again when, within us that gets dampened through the everyday, day-to-day -day living of living in your comfort zone. And that spark is just an ember waiting to, to um, burst into flame, which oftentimes, like you're saying, there's this idea of fear. And we're so scared of fear in, in some of us, or we just don't like the feeling of fear. But it truly does ignite that feeling of being alive. And I think a lot of that is lacking in many of us at times throughout our life, um, where we do get stuck in the patterns that we're so comfortable 100%, with. 100%. And I love when a conversation comes full circle, because that place you're talking about is a super conscious mind. Mm -hmm. the, con the conscious mind tries to figure it all out. The unconscious mind just lets, lets it, lets, you know, is, is ruled by things that it doesn't understand. The superconscious mind says, there's something bigger here that's trying to happen. I don't have to control it. I don't have to just relegate it to, you know, a habit pattern. I'm going to allow myself to get out of my habit patterns and I'll experience a world that's being given to me if I would only open up my hands to receive it. Well, when you roll mm -hmm. through Denver, you'll have, uh, you'll have. You'll oh have oh no. Hold it. Where did you come from? <laughs> well, you got, you got people to take care of you when you roll through Colorado. I can't wait for that. I, 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 I can't wait to meet you guys and sit with you and hug you and just love you and listen to you and be with you because um, it's a funny thing that happens through a podcast, isn't it? We really get close to each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just I, this, this day and age with technology, to be able to meet somebody and become their friend, I would call you my friend, and to have never had met, you know, you just, just yes. think – not long ago, this was impossible. The idea of, you know, making friends, maybe, maybe I guess you could, you know, it could be akin to pen pals. Um, but you know, to, to be able to have somebody, you know, be called friend and, and really mean it and be a close friend with somebody and not really know them. It's, it's pretty incredible. I love it. And when I come to Denver, we will definitely sit together for sure. Better. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> We're going to hold you I, to absolutely. it. Absolutely. I, I, you know, you won't get me out of your house or home or a restaurant or whatever. That, that's happened I, before. I know. I, I promise. <laughs> that my, my commitment is I'm not going to stay longer than two nights anywhere. Because I think that that's... I think one night is probably the most that I should stay. Like two nights on one side of the bed, two nights on the other side of the bed, that's a, two nights yeah, on, on the, the floor, yeah. in the other room. In the, yeah. Right. <laughs> I missed you earlier on, Brian. Why weren't you here? <laughs> I, I had a uh, scheduling conflict. Yeah, but but really what I, what I can't, like, we don't have enough time to have this conversation. What in the heck happened to you? I was so looking forward to your skepticism, and now you're like a convert. I'm, I'm the, the, the king of personal development now. I know, like, what the heck happened to you? <laughs> I grew. Like, Oh my Learn, God. Learn, change, grow. That's what, I mean, that's what it was about for me. That's what this journey of being a part of the podcast was about. It wasn't about staying a skeptic. And I mean, even, even when I was the quote unquote skeptic, I, uh, I was largely playing a role because we needed it. And yes. you know, we just, you know, Nicole and Lisa tried their best to, to spoon feed me things. And, and I, and I was very skeptical and I was very resistant. And then I, discovered Hal Elrod. And you met a guy on an airplane, actually. I, I did. I met, wow. a guy, I met a guy on an airplane who recommended this book to me and absolutely 
life changing, life altering. Uh, yeah. I'm so not, are you a Scientologist now? Is that what oh, you are? Good God, no, I'm no. If 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 I'm anything, I I'd be Buddhist. But I don't. I don't. Okay. Like, I don't. Because you said L. Ron Hubbard. I thought you were no, a Scientologist. No, no. Now. Hal Hal Elrod. Oh, Hal Elrod. I so how you see how already how good of a listener I am. Yeah, no, you, I heard you, Hal Elrod <laughs> is L. Ron Hubbard. If, if you don't, if you don't know Hal Elrod and his books, The Miracle Morning and the Miracle Miracle Equation, you should you should check them out. Thank you. I will do that. L. Ron Hubbard. No, L. Hal Elrod. Hal Elrod. E. L. R. O. D. Well, it's nice to have you here with us. Yeah, I'm glad I got to swing in at the end. Yes. Yeah. Danny, you know, I'm really excited to hear about your, your journey. And of course, we are excited to hear about it in person for a couple of days when you when you do swing through Colorado. Um, I, and I'm sure you're aware of this. And uh, to our listeners, you know, one of the beautiful aspects uh, that happen uh, when you completely surrender the way, Danny, you're going to be doing for this trip and not have any plans and let everything just kind of figure itself out and you be supported by the by God, the universe. Um, is that so many synchronicities happen yeah. that don't that you don't see or you're aware of in the comfort zone where you're planning everything. Yeah. And, you know, I remember really quickly when I was in Costa Rica and I had no plans and I was now on, I was getting a bus, which I had no idea how to use the bus system down there. And I was figuring everything out on, on a, on a whim that I started talking to this man was we waited for the bus and then we got on the bus and we started talking and he was just talking to me. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I really, I wonder what this place is that I'm going to is like, I wonder if there's anything I need to be aware of. And he just starts talking to me and telling me, you know, if you're going to this place, I've been living here for a while and just be aware of men doing this. Like he started to paint a scenario for me. And I was like, oh, he goes, and just, just be aware, but just be mindful of it. Nothing to be scared of. Just be mindful of it. I was like, oh, and what's your name? He's like, Angel. Oh, wow. I'm like, oh. I'm uh, like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and just so happens that on that trip, I had a man approach me that ended up creating a bit of a scenario with me that I had to escape from. Uh, um, and so it was like he was giving me advice through the name of an angel um, that was, you know, that actually helped me out and made me a little bit more aware of what was happening. Wow. So like these beautiful synchronicities that are going to be happening for you, I'm just so excited. And I'm sure that's going to be part of the adventure on top of becoming a listener. It already is because as you were speaking about it, I wanted to invite anybody who's listening to this to do exactly what these guys did to me when I come to Denver. Say, you're welcome to come and stay with us. I'm sure you'll put the contact information in the show notes. If anybody feels drawn or inspired by this trip that I'm about to go on and wants to be a part of it by, by being a part of it, by actually being film and bringing a gathering together and listening to people. And um, I, I want to invite you to invite me. Uh, and it might not be to stay in your home. It might just be for a, a meal or a, or, you know, a moment together, whatever that would be, but let's use the synchronicity of each moment now to allow ourselves to have like an experience that we never even imagined could be possible. And what would happen if we just opened up the world in that way? So fabulous. Thank you for um, that opportunity. Well, thank you, Danny, for being back on the show. It was such a pleasure to have you back on. The hour just flew by. And um, we'll leave all of that information for uh, our listeners to please contact Danny if you'd like to um, meet up with him and challenge his listening skills. I think that would be great. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to fail. Don't worry. And, uh, no. Excuse me. <laughs> well, thanks, Danny. And thank you to our audience for joining us once again. We love you all. And we'll be back with you next time. Thank you all for joining our show. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting us. If you have any questions you would like answered on the show or any guests you would like to hear on our show, please email that information to us at info at enlightenup.us. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you're interested in contacting Nicole or myself for some coaching or any of the other services we provide, you can find out more about Nicole at inflexibleme.com and my website is lisaloveslove.com. Thank you again for joining us and supporting our show, and we will be back with you all next week.